I'm Scott Alamores, the 27th of June, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And today we are walking through what can only be best described as the projects of Fundesi in Southern Leon. We're gonna take you around and show you what this area is like right after the bump. All right, for those who have not been following along, this is our third episode that we are filming here in the Barrio Fundesi. This is one of the southernmost, if possibly the southernmost barrio of Leon proper. Anything beyond this would be Repartos and Colonias. Uh, this is partially a really nice barrio that butts up against the university areas, but the center of Fundesi uh, is actually highly restricted to traffic. It's mostly pedestrian ways only. It is a uh, very, very, different area than we've seen in the rest of the country and it is essentially the projects this is where large apartment buildings and areas that have no no roads exist it's a lot of pedestrian ways winding between um, old apartment buildings i have no idea what the history uh, or the story is of this region but it's very interesting to walk through because it is so completely different than anything we've seen in other parts of the city or even other parts of Nicaragua. Um, I, I can only imagine that this was sponsored by a foreign government at some point and brought in foreign architects who uh, were involved because the style would remind you more of an England or Ukraine or a Russia than it would of Latin America, at least in my experience. But it certainly does not remind me of anything anywhere else in Nicaragua. So I wanna show a little bit of this and then, uh, and I'm gonna try to bring up a map right now while I'm talking, you can see a little bit, but I've been here for a minute. So it's a good time to bring up a map and give you kind of a starting point of where we are really close to the U of M campus. So you can kind of get a feel for where we're gonna explore. We're really close to where we've been on other episodes. Like we have not gone far afield, uh, but this really shows how quickly uh, everything changes here. So I'm gonna spin this around. These are, it is very rare. Right, for Leon or anywhere in Nicaragua, extremely rare here. I don't know anywhere else where you're gonna find three-story building. This is a lot of heavy cinder block. These are strong buildings, but you'll notice there's, there's no glass here or very, very little. Uh, these are mostly wide open buildings. And this actually reminds me, I used to live in old Soviet apartment blocks, actual projects in Kiev, Ukraine. And this area reminds me of that. Everything from the way that these sidewalks go through to the buildings, of course, they're much, much smaller here and they're designed around the hot temperatures instead of in Kiev. They're designed to deal with the very cold temperatures, but that's what we're dealing with. It feels it, more than anywhere, uh, this portion of the city gives me a feeling like a Kiev or like a Chisinau, uh, which we experienced when we lived in Eastern Europe. Now, right here, I'm on the road and we just came off the road, but a lot of this region of the city, Buenos Tardes, is pedestrian only. And that's really interesting because there's very little pedestrian only built into the city. So this is unique as we walk through, you'll see like none of this looks like other things we've shown in Nicaragua. Now, I don't know where the pit goes underneath that stairway. That's that's scary. But um, we have these little walkways like they've actually done a good job of making these little walkways quite attractive. But these buildings are, are a little bit scary, actually, um, not from a walking through standpoint, but a this has to be a very tough area to live in. This is from looking at it, from eyeballing, this feels like the poorest section of non-shanty uh, housing um, that I've seen in the city. Oh, we have a cute doggy here and no puppy. But this whole area has all these interesting small little pathways uh, that, I mean, obviously they're sidewalks, but the, they're not really sidewalks because a sidewalk, the term sidewalk refers to the fact that it's going along a road and this is not. These are the actual uh, access paths as you go through the buildings. Now, a lot of these do give you a feeling of being student housing. If you were to say that these were dorms and look at the United States in the 1960s or even the 1950s, you'd say, oh, oh, that does kind of remind me of dorm living. This is not unlike the dorms that I lived in in the 1990s, which were considered a big upgrade over what had been there before that. And that's uh, very much the style and uh, the, the connections where you don't have roads connecting between places, but rather just the sidewalks is a very college campus kind of thing. Now we're gonna pop out onto one of the roads here and I'm gonna try to get away. This is a, 
I think a bar that I'm next to has some music going on. So I'm trying to get, not get too close so we don't get blown out by the music. It's very easy to get lost on these roads because none of them go in a direction you expect and they all turn uh, and go kind of sideways. So we're gonna head down, I think forward and just keep exploring. But I, found, I first found this area uh, about a year ago when I would get dropped off by the bus at the at the Uno station and I had to get to Laborio. Oh, there's a doggy in the way. I didn't even see him. You're a very chill dog. And I would come down and try to work my way through the city to get to uh, to get to Laborio. And trying to go diagonally through the city led me through Fundesi and I ended up discovering this area because I walk everywhere. And it is not what I expected, and it really throws you off, and it really makes going by map through the city very difficult. So if you're actually out on foot, I recommend not attempting this. I'm really out here because I want to show you guys what it is like out here. And certainly, you know, I think a lot of times on this channel we talk about how great everything is in Nicaragua, and certainly I love it here, and it's fantastic. I do want to point out that these are... So nestled throughout these buildings, there are little shops. I'm not quite sure what this one is, but there's some kind of busing or logistics service uh, between Nicaragua and Costa Rica running out of this building. And there's little pulperias back here. You'll find every so often like a little home restaurant or whatever. But uh, it's important. Oh, what a cute uh, little spot. It's important that we also go to places that are a bit more rough, that are a bit more impoverished, that show that life is not always perfect. Um, I certainly am not trying to candy coat uh, Nicaragua, but so many people focus on the poverty and so many people focus on the problems and, and things that are less than perfect. There's a, actually a cute little garden on the corner up there. Uh, and coming through, I don't know what that was. Uh, coming through this area and seeing that there is uh, this type of uh, this style, I guess, of poverty, the style of living where we have uh, kind of like the projects, so different than what we've seen. We do have more modern projects here in Nicaragua that are not what Americans would call the projects, right? We have this vision when we say the projects of this inner city apartment dwellings that uh, were common in the US, especially in the like 1970s. Hola! Someone in one of those windows is calling to me, but I couldn't find him. This place is for sale? Yes, it is. This building is for sale. It's interesting that that's considered a house that you're able to sell and not a city-owned apartment building. All right, we're going to head down here. You can see the, the motorcycles going down the little pathways is interesting. All right, let's go this way. Uh, so this, this whole, so in, in the 70s, in the U.S., we built these apartments uh, that were not unlike this. And a lot of, uh, at least the part of the country that I grew up in, um, they were pretty common um, in like upstate New York, in western Pennsylvania, uh, in the northeast, in the, in the old, um, the Rust Belt cities, we have still lingering on these old apartment buildings. Now, obviously, they're much bigger than here because we had much higher population density even back then. Uh, but the, the idea, the style remained. And I don't know what this little railing is for on the side. That's very strange. Look how, wait how skinny this building is <laughs> there's like this tiny little something on the corner with this big railing that's weird use of the space I guess controlling kind of how traffic flows through and that's where we just walked up that had that so we just came from here uh see I told you it's easy to get turned around I'm turned around we're backtracking already but does this go somewhere let's find out I can never tell nope no, well, I don't think we can get through on that corner. I think we have to head back this way and go down and around. Definitely very hard to navigate, no question there. 
but a lot of life goes on here. Certainly it is a lived in area and nothing is abandoned or anything like that. So this makes for an extremely different experience. But it's also important to point out that while we're looking at a, an area that is much rougher and an area that is very different than we have experienced other places, hello kitty, that we're also still, still dealing with a very safe area that I'm in no way concerned about walking around or being in. Okay. So one thing I do like the look of a lot of these roads, like these well manicured trees and little sidewalks. So we're going to head down another direction down these little tiny paths. And here we have a chair reupholstery company going on on the sidewalk. Buenas tardes. That's incredibly interesting. Oh, this garden and that's different. Buenas tardes. As you can imagine, I've been down here a number of times. However, I never bring the camera, so that this is a first. But in coming down here, uh, I've never seen another foreigner whatsoever, right? Like not a thing that happens. Um, and, and it's not an area where I would necessarily encourage you to come and explore. Uh, it's, not, it's not an area where you're going to find restaurants and, and activities and things to do. We came through here already, so this is the way we didn't come. But I think that a lot of my viewers will get a sense of concern looking at an area like this that given the poverty, given the, the style of living, that it must be dangerous, must be something they should be scared of. And that is not at all the case. At no point do I have any concern for safety in this area. This is simply a lower cost area. Um, and, it, and it has a look that we associate with, with danger coming from the United States, but that is, is not the case here. Um, I, don't, I don't think that there's any, any cause for that kind of concern in this particular area. Um, certainly, there can be an association with poverty, with there being a less safe area, right? If you're going through Fatima, okay, it's hard to be safer than Fatima, I suppose. Um, and, and being... Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you heard him, he yelled, sup guys, as he, as he went by on the, on the motorcycle. So even here, right, you're getting a pretty friendly group of people in general. I can't really put the camera that way because of how bright it is. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's misleading. And, and, and many times, I, I've done some episodes about this, about how when you're coming from a North American context and you come to uh, any place that, that's incredibly different, um, we tend to bring a certain amount of our own context with us, obviously, like that's, that's going to happen and we have to gauge things. Let me give you an example. When I spent some time in England, I ended up in some places that were legitimately pretty dangerous in England, and I had no idea that they were because my context as an American is any place that has a British accent is awfully safe, right? So it's a very different thing. We got some graffiti here. That's actually showing up really well on the camera. I like that. So I like being able to show this because it's so completely a different look on Nicaragua than you, than you get anywhere else. And if you were to show me pictures of this, I'd have a really hard time figuring out that I'm in Central America at all. But, but Nicaragua especially, uh, it looks like nothing else that you're, you're going to see here. Oh, we have a lot of people out on the street here. Buenas tardes. <laughs> Universally, wherever you go, everyone likes to be on camera. That is... That is never, never not the case. All right, so today I did get um, an email from one of the viewers and he was a little bit worried um, for good reason about, he didn't really want to appear negative on the show because obviously we're trying very hard to give a very honest and open view of Nicaragua and we don't want to end up with this kind of like negative input and be, uh, we're back, we're back at the cool nail place. I find it very easy to accidentally double back on myself when I'm in, in Fundesi. I have no idea where I am, but I'm about to head into an interesting little area uh, right up here. And uh, uh, so he sent me an email and he's like, ah, there's a bunch of things I'd kind of like it if you addressed. Because um, I feel that he really felt that I was um, 
not the way that he put it, but what he meant to say was that I was candy coating the Nicaraguan experience. Um, however, I think all of his points are worth pointing out and addressing, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read them off my phone uh, while I'm out walking around and talk about them, uh, because in, in some cases I think he has good points, and in some cases I think talking about his points are important. So I'm going to bring that up and, uh, and read that to you while we're here on this interesting corner. Oh, here's a little... Where does this go? I might take that. Or I might take that. Wait. I spoke too soon. I'm not ready. I have to see where I am. Which place is the bigger adventure? By the way, I'm in talks with a couple people about doing a road trip to San Salvador. Not guaranteed we're going to do it, but we've got someone with a car who wants to do it. And uh, oh, I wanted to go this way. Yes, this is where I wanted to be. This little like park-like spot. I'm going to bring up the stuff on my phone and then check out this Maria Helena Palacios, right? That's the actual name of the projects here. It's the palaces of Maria Helena. Elena, it's, it's Maria Elena, right? The H's don't exist. It's just to mark the beginning of the word. And uh, yeah, that's an interesting name, I think, for the projects here, but we're gonna bring up that email, uh, but we are working on a plan to possibly go to San Salvador. It'll be in July, I think and uh, would be pretty fantastic. There's a lot I want to show there, a lot of just getting out and doing some stuff that's really, really different, and a road trip from Leon to San Salvador would definitely be it. So let me know what you think of that. Get down in the comments before I continue. Uh, take just a, a moment to, to give me a thumbs up, Get smash that like button. It makes a huge difference. If you, you want to support the channel, I'm going to put the link up now. Buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That supports what we do here on the channel, helps make this possible. New cameras, which by the way, there's some new cameras out that I really want to get, and I kind of have to make a decision really quickly because my wife's about to return from Vietnam and uh, come through the U.S. and be able to bring my stuff from Texas. And uh, uh, if you get a chance, take this, this link, put it somewhere, like on social media, tell your friends, uh, get down in those comments, uh, ask questions, let me know what you think of this episode, where we're walking, things you want to see, say hi, all that stuff. Give up likes to post down there. Everything you do helps support the channel. So the more you can interact, the better. And then uh, let's get to these questions because I think they're going to be interesting. All right, these are from Dwayne. And uh, he writes, he has a whole number of points. So we're going to do our best to get to these before the camera overheats. All right, the first one up, uh, he's talking about, so this is in response to my last Fundesi episode. So it's perfect time that I'm doing this Fundesi episode now, right? So that worked out. Uh, so in the last one, if you didn't watch, I talked about getting off at the southern uh, terminal here in Leon at the, the Uno station. First up, he said, okay, the whole bus station thing in Leon, the locals do need to change buses at the main terminal. They don't have money to take a taxi from the gas station to travel an hour away to the countryside where they live, for example. Yes, this is a good point. Um, so a couple things on that, like he's correct. Right, that, that is true. Um, for people who are watching my channel, when I say you, you should get off at the Southern Station, I'm talking to English speakers who are watching the show. That is my context. I don't mean to imply um, that the Northern Terminal has no point, that there are no cases where it went. And I think, I haven't gone back and watched it, but I don't think I said everyone should get off there. I said you should generally get off there for most things that you're doing and then walk or take the taxi because you can walk to almost all the city. Of course, if you're going to Fatima, even if you're a, a wealthy expat and heading up to that area, you're going to want to take the northern one because that's closer to Fatima. But for most access to the city, including downtown, you want the southern one. The northern one is not a good access. And you can take buses from the southern one as well as the northern one if they're just going around the city. If you have to go on to another city, then Leon is not your destination. And the context of that conversation was if you're coming to Leon, not if you're going to the terminal to get another bus. The other thing, though, that I do want to point out, because he says if you're going an hour away in the countryside, there is no hour away in the countryside here in Leon. The area serviced by the Leon bus station would only go about 20 minutes out into the country. That's roughly the distance. And those areas would be serviced by another bus, um, not a taxi, which, which he said. Right. So if you're coming from Managua, the distance from Managua to here is only 85 minutes. Uh, so about half of that time you would be getting off somewhere in Managua. You wouldn't be talking about Leon at all. And if you're coming to Leon, then you are, uh, Buenos tardes. <laughs> then you're in a zone where the farthest you would be going out uh, would not be at all. Like if you came into Leon, you wouldn't be going in the Managua direction at all. You would have gotten off before you got there. Um, pretty much, and I've talked about this before, everything lies along the road. There aren't all these crossroads like you get in other countries like in the U.S. And so the idea that you need to like branch off and go in all these directions is very unlikely. 
basically everyone can come in on the bus, gets dropped off and then walks or gets picked up by family or something pretty near to where they are. There isn't this idea that you're gonna come into Leon and then go back out on a bus unless you're going on on the bus. In which case, yes, you definitely need to go to the bus terminal to make a transfer, but you would be going to get the, the Chinandega bus to go to the other side of the city because there's only the two sides. Um, if you were going to Sutiava, for example, then you're very much a special case. Uh, but again, you may walk, right? If you're in a position where you can't afford a taxi, you may be like me, who could afford a taxi, yes, but uh, I will get off at the southern station and walk to the bus station in Sutiava and then go on from there and skip all the buses in between. You certainly don't have to do that. It's only whatever 25 cents to take one around the city, but it's a lot more like I just like to walk across the city. Um, but those, those are kind of the options. So he, he's correct. Like, yes, locals who are making connections or going to the northern parts of the city will need to go on to the northern terminal. I did not mean to imply that the northern terminal had no purpose and that absolutely no one should take it. But please, just in general, the context of my show is I'm speaking to English speakers, presumably who don't live in the country. If you are someone who is catching, if you're a local and you're constantly catching buses to different places, you are not watching my show to get advice on where to go on the bus. You are a regular of the public transportation system. Maybe I need to say that, but that is my assumed context uh, that those people know exactly what they're doing and, and have no need to listen to my advice in English. All right, and question number two was electricity. He said, a lot of Nicaraguans don't even have electricity. What percentage of electricity do I think that people have here? That's a good question, and it's worth addressing because I think Americans are very much under the impression that things are a lot more backwards than they are. Um, in many cases, remember electricity and internet, we generally consider Nicaragua to be ahead of the United States, not behind. So ask the same question of the United States, what percentage of Americans do we think have internet and, and uh, electricity, especially? And the answer is, well, an awful lot of them, 99 or higher percent. You simply assume everyone has access to electricity, at least most of the time. And I'm gonna say the same answer exists here. Actually, I wanna show there's some businesses here. Hola! And this is a very tight little spot we're sneaking down. So where does, does electricity, really a question would be, where does electricity not exist in Nicaragua? And honestly, I don't know of any place that doesn't have electricity. I've never encountered something in Nicaragua that isn't electrified. That is uh, possible, of course. Um, and I assume some places do exist. This is a little garden in the middle of the city that I should have been showing instead of showing my face, who cares? And, uh, oh, we have a tall building in front of us. I like popping out on a little garden path and finding a tall building. What is Tardes? Oh, shall we go that way? I think we shall, or this way is more gardeny. Let's take a look. Of course, I'm gonna double back on myself regardless of what I do and retrace my paths because I'm lost. Okay, so honestly, I think something like 99% of Nicaragua has electricity. Maybe that's overblown, but I don't know where doesn't. Small villages in the country, big city. And of course the argument is that there's so many people who are so poor they can't afford electricity, but that's not really the case. Electricity is subsidized here. Notice that these are apartment two Palacio 162, like these are apartment numbers on these buildings so that they can be identified. Those are chickens, by the way, in case you don't notice them there. Uh, so, you know, whether it's areas like this, or it's small villages, or it's tiny farms, or it's remote islands, all of those things have electricity. There are exceptions, I'm sure. I've not encountered them, but that doesn't mean they don't exist, and I assume that they do. I'm not trying to make the claim that they don't. Absolutely, they must. But even if you're out on Los uh, Brasiles, right? Oh, this is interesting. Just stepping through this building. Dun, da, da, da. All right, where are we now? And if you're out in Los Brasiles, north of Ponoloya, uh, out on the beach, do they have power? Yes, but their power is solar. Uh, but that does exist. There is power there. Is there power out on Ometepe? Yes, everywhere in Ometepe that I've ever been has power. It may not be as reliable as it is here on the mainland, but they have it. The Corn Islands have power. Remote villages, incredibly remote villages, hanging out on the edge of Nicaraguan civilization have power. And because it's subsidized, uh, the only issue they have is getting it run to different places, not affording it. So uh, basically the way that it works, and we've talked about this before, 
is that if you use a small amount of power, especially if you don't have an air conditioning, of course, if you don't have fans, if you don't have television, if you don't have those things, you're only using light bulbs and necessity uh, items, a microwave for a few minutes, if that's something which unlikely to have in that scenario. But if you're only using electricity carefully and limited to what's really needed and not luxury items, then your electricity is essentially free, or it may actually be free. They may not bother billing at all. And those of us who use a lot more electricity, those of us running air conditioners for sure and watching TV and running computers and all that sort of stuff, we pay a premium, which I am thrilled to do so, in order to make electricity free for those who use essentially none of it. That's a great system and it ends up with the result of that system is that everybody has electricity because who are you not going to give electricity to when it's free? It's not like the people have to pay for it. It is provided by the government and it is their desire to get it out to everyone. They want to make sure that everybody has that electricity. That's why they're paying for it in the first place that it's free. So I don't know what the actual density of electricity is, and they stopped to look at me for a minute while I was filming. I don't know what the actual density of electricity usage is in the country, but what I do know is that when we say, but it's so poor, are there really people who have electricity all over? Yes, Nicaraguans really do have electricity and internet essentially everywhere. So yes, electricity is available, and yes, people can use it for sure. I'm standing here looking at my phone and a huge group of people has just walked through the area I'm in. I have no idea what's going on. They all have folders and they're, they're kind of like a tour group. I don't know what's going on. It's very strange. Never seen anything like this. Maybe they're inspectors. Sometimes you get volunteer inspectors like mosquito inspectors. I don't know. All right, we're continuing on to question three, but first I'm going to spin the camera around once we get in the shadow so we don't blow out the lens and see the side of this building and this cute little garden path that people have made as it goes through this building, like... Oh, and a kitty. I was not expecting the kitty guarding the path. That's perfect. There is an effort, a very clear effort, to make this area into something very livable, and I feel that it really does so, that it really is, for the most part, a, a pretty livable area. Um, obviously not a place you're going to seek out. It's a, it's a place where you live out of necessity, but I think that uh, people have put in an effort to make it into a pretty pretty nice community. Uh, so the, the next question was about heat. Uh, Dwayne said that, you know, a lot of people have metal roofs and there's not a lot of airflow and the majority of, of Nicaraguans get extremely hot uh, and it's unbearable. So, and, and he said he's never been on, on any of his visits to Nicaragua, uh, been in a condition where he was not super hot. So this is, I've talked about this before and this is certainly true. The key here is two things. One, he's talking about the roofs. That roofing material is kind of, true um, and you can see a little bit there this one is metal here this one is ceramic there the metal roofs do get very hot uh, the buildings do typically have very good airflow though um, there's a couple things that we then discussed uh, about oh hold on just putting in agave and gardens over here i feel like these buildings need paint and all the the, like there's there's little things that can be done it could go a long way but of course that takes money and if you can do that you move on uh, so the the idea that it's too hot, right? The thing that he said that's really important is when he visited. And I've said this before, when I visited, it was painfully hot. You can't handle the heat at all because it's, uh, it's a moderate humidity. It's not a high humidity, but it's not a low humidity. It's not dry. And uh, show a little bit more of the paths going back there between more, this, this, these paths go on and on. Like this is a really immense complex of, of paths everywhere. When you visit, when I visited in 20, 20, when I moved here in 2015, I never got to a point where I was really feeling cool. Uh, and I lived in Granada. Uh, when I came in 2019, it was unbearable. But I remember checking the temperature, it was 84 degrees. If you gave me an 84 degree day right now, I could put a jacket on, right? And I know people have been recently on the channel like, no one should be wearing a jacket, no one's that cold. They really are. Nicaraguans are actually putting on jackets in the 80s. They're, they're covering up in blankets outside in the 70s. They're used to 90 plus every day. It's pretty much even. So when you get one of those cooler days, I know it doesn't sound 
cold, but it is when you live here. When this is where you are full time, uh, you are starting to get cold at completely different temperatures. No idea why, but this blue and orange is, is really attractive. The rest of the building, like, you're like, why, why did they do that? But they did. This one is for sale. I wonder what sales of these are like, right? Like, that's got to be very interesting. What is that? All right. So when you live here full time, your scale of temperature will change. Mine certainly has. People have said to me, right, I don't know how you're out in a, in a hat and walking and you're in the sunlight and it's 95, 98 degrees. There's days where it's been 100 and I'm out walking. Like you're, I mean, you're getting, mo you know, moist, of course, but you're not dripping with sweat. You're not dying of exhaustion. You're not stopping and picking up a nice water. How, how are you doing this? There's no fan, there's no nothing. And it's because I've been here for years and you start to adjust. I'm from New York. I used to think that 65 was warm, that I would go out at 65 degrees in shorts without a problem living in New York, right? It's a, it's a different world and I've adapted over the years to being here and it's an even temperature every day. So you really do adapt. It doesn't matter what you think temperatures are. To Nicaraguans, this is normal. Now, Nicaraguans don't have a tendency to go outside and go, I'm gonna freeze to death, right? That is not a thing. Just like Eskimos don't go outside and go, oh, I'm gonna expire, how can I get enough water to stay cool? Like, obviously there is a, a happy temperature at which human bodies are at their optimum, and this is warmer than that, and, and Alaska is colder than that. But for most of the world, where you live, you get used to what it is and you adapt. And so people who live here full-time, who grew up here, go out on a day like this and Sure, if they're doing athletics, they're going to be in shorts, but it's easy to find people who are in jeans. Let's, let's, I'm just going to look at this big group of people that just walked up behind me. Every single person is in pants. Some of those people are in long sleeves. People have, you know, backpacks on, um, collared shirts, and no one's like dying. Some people are in double shirts. Hola! Lo siento? Mi, mi canal? No, Ah, sí, for, for YouTube, sí. These kids wanted to see if we're on YouTube. Uh, so all those people, they're, they're dressed quite warm, but it's very, very warm today. I mean, it's not the worst, but it's, it's quite warm and there's very little air movement. Um, so that's the first thing that he felt warm, that you felt warm, Dwayne, is misleading. I would have felt warm too, but it's not that warm. Um, and especially uh, so he said, well, here in Leon, it looks like maybe this is a lot more luxurious, like this is nicer than, than the rest of the country. And that's not at all true. This is actually the second hottest city in the country. See, <laughs> see, sí. sí. in YouTube. See, sí. there's that. As Scott Allen Miller vlog. See. Sí. <laughs> Busca para para Fundesi in YouTube. So, uh, so Leon is one of the hottest cities in the country. Only Chinandega is hotter. We are much hotter than Managua. And so when people come and say, "Oh, you know, it's hot," but the rest of the country is hot, Leon is cool. No, no, no. We're the hot ones, right? If you're in Managua and you talk to locals and say, yeah, we're going to go up to Leon, they will all warn you. Well, you know, Leon is really hot. Here's a house, by the way. They're still following me. And, uh, and the pharmacy and the projects behind. So this is where it's hotter. This is a really, really hot city, even for Leon. And speaking of hot, I'm going to get in the shadows. It's a little bit, a little bit nicer. The other thing is, uh, so, so, it's not as hot as it seems, but if you're a visitor, it's going to seem hot. It's going to seem really, really hot. And that's something you have to, if you're, if you're coming to Nicaragua to like, check it out. You really, sorry, the camera's really, I'm struggling trying to control it while I drive it or, oh my gosh, I can't even talk. If you're visiting Nicaragua, it is going to feel really, really hot for almost anyone. Cause you're coming from a place that's so much colder that this continuous heat 
wears on you and you're gonna be like, oh, it's so hot, how can anyone live there? But when you actually live here, you go, actually, it's super pleasant. And I, how do people live in the United States where the temperature goes up and down all the time, right? It's a different thing that you adjust to. And this is actually quite temperate for those of us who live here. Now, of course, it's not temperate like El Salvador temperate, temperate or like, like Guatemala, which is just crazy nice for, for weather. But it is, it is because it's the same every day, it is quite nice and we're able to get used to it. And people are not expiring in their houses as very rarely a thing. Of course, anywhere people get too hot, right? But it's the heat in Texas right now, right now as we speak, is life threatening to all kinds of people. And constantly in the UK, it's a threat. I'm coming back past places I've been. We've already done the, the chair repair guys over there. So I'm kind of turned around or lost. Uh, gonna walk up into the shade and check the map again, but um, hola. Uh, but it really, it really isn't the dangerous temperatures. It really isn't the extreme temperatures that Americans tend to think that it is. Even Americans who've been here and experienced, you have to be here. And we know people who say, like as travelers, if they come and go, they never get used to it. And it's really, really hot. Uh, oh, here's the bus. Everyone's on the bus. Hola. <laughs> Uh, people we know that live here, but they come and go, they talk about how they never get a chance to adapt and it becomes really hot and it's very difficult for them. Um, but for those of us who stay here and don't come and go, it becomes very comfortable very quickly and it's, it's quite enjoyable and we don't really want to go back to colder temperatures. So it's all about that perspective. But uh, the other part was all these metal roofs in the houses without airflow. So there's a couple things about that. One is that that's really only a Managua thing. The rest of the country, while we have the metal roofs, everyone's got airflow. Everyone has wide open spaces, but Managua has much lower temperatures. When I stay in Managua, I stay in generally not very expensive housing and it's completely cool. I don't even need the windows open much of the time. In the middle of the day, yes, of course. But at, like at night when you're sleeping, you can close the windows. You might want a fan, but it's not bad because it's not that hot. It's not Leon hot. Managua is so pleasant compared to Leon most of the time. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really, really not bad. So that was a long rambling thing. The heat is nothing like people think it is. When you get people who visit, you're constantly getting these stories of how hot it is. And it came from me too. When I was here in 2019 in San Juan del Sur, I was dying the entire week. And some of the people we were with were dying the entire week. They couldn't handle the heat at all. It was in the 80s. That would be such a pleasant day to me now. When I first got here in 2021, moving back, every day was painful. Now, those same days, I would not think twice about it. Going out to eat, every time we went to a restaurant, was, where can we get air? Is there a fan on us? Oh, it's so hot. I can't, I'm dripping with sweat while we eat. Now, the same restaurants, even hotter. I don't even think about it. I'm in a collared shirt. I'm in, I'm in heavier clothes. I'm wearing shoes. I sit down. I don't even need a fan on. I'm just comfortable. Oh, is it warm? I didn't, I didn't notice, right? It, it's amazing how fast that changes for you. So it, it, that's, that's really important for looking at it. All right, we're trying to come through another area I've never been to before, and I think we succeeded. I do not know what this building is at all. It is big and low. We got some got some writing on the side of the building over here. We're gonna work away another place for sale. Or no, they're selling stuff. Oh, this is actually a very attractive front of this house right here. It's a very different little spot from where we've been. Okay, and what do we have? Oh, this is city. This is, so Alcadia means the city facilities. This is one of the like where trucks and, and heavy equipment is kept and managed for the city of Leon. That's the city signal right there. You can see the project buildings right down there. And that's not really a building, it's more of just a big outside wall as we come by. So that kind of makes sense as to where we are. Okay, so the next question he had, or the next comment he really had, and this is the one that's most important, I think, is he talked about his time in Managua and how he never felt safe when he was in Nicaragua. And he, so uh, uh, he made some points about safety concerns and said he visited on many occasions and, and always felt very, unsafe or wary at least and 
this prompts some questions on my behalf, of course, of where are you? What are you doing? What, what caused you to feel unsafe? Why would you feel unsafe? When did this happen? And it's uncovered a couple important points. And he does have some important points, right? Like he did feel unsafe. Um, so one, just because Nicaragua is a ridiculously safe country, like truly epically safe, does not mean there are no dangerous situations or that nothing bad happens. Canada is also a very, very safe country. Clearly, people are murdered in Canada from time to time. These things happen, right? We don't want to. We don't want to dismiss murders, but but bad things happen to good people sometimes, and there's nothing that can be done about it. And the safest places still carry some danger. Hola. <laughs> They're screaming, hey, a gringo. Um, and now this is interesting. This is like, I can't tell what we're looking at. This is like what used to be projects and is now some beautiful big houses. There's, I'm going to turn the camera around a little bit. Okay, so the Alcadilla is right there on the corner. These kids are coming up and they're all discussing me. This is a really large confluence of two boulevards. Look at these. Now, obviously, it's not being maintained, but this has potential to be some beautiful spots. This needs to be mown, but these beautiful, I think, locust trees in the middle of this sidewalk area, and then this sidewalk that goes around like this. Like, this is neat. Um, it, clearly, it's old and not maintained. I'm not saying that this is some groundbreaking thing, but look in here. This is potentially a really nice house here, potentially a nice one over here. The sidewalk is really weird. <coughs> Sorry. And then is this a house or an apartment building? I can't tell, but we've stepped into something utterly different than where we were just a minute ago. Ooh, I like, oh my gosh, this street is cool. What have we found here in Fundesi? Okay, my expectation was to go that way, but we're gonna go this way. I'm gonna bring up a map and see what, no, we're not even gonna bring up a map. Let's go. Look at this beautiful corner spot. Okay, I think that's one. I think this is another. So that place over there looks pretty cool. But then this place, look at look at those beautiful upstairs windows. This is like a brand new, I think, apartment building with some really cool new apartments. This shows how easy it is to sneak into a cool little corner of the city and build something beautiful and wonderful and make a huge difference. This feels like something to me out of Guatemala or out of Matagalpa. Does not fit in Leon at all, but this is a beautiful little circular road here in Fundesi. What have we found? These are my favorite, right? My favorite is when we stumble on something amazing in the middle of something that we thought was just going to be kind of nothing, right? Like we were in the projects. Okay, look here. Once upon a time, this was a big circle made there and some of it has broken away, but that could be easily replaced and made into a beautiful little spot again. This place you know, none of these look super expensive. Like, we're not talking about that this is a fancy area. That building is. That building could, could be in Europe. There's so much potential here. Hi! Are you the sweet little puppy? Yeah. And then this is an older projects building that looks like it's been updated and modified. They have nice gardens, nice fences. This is a Latin fitness place. This is a driveway, I assume. Yes. Oh, look at the pink house behind. What? What is all of this? This is so interesting. I have this beautiful flower art there. This is a truly amazing street. And I do have to say, the temperature has dropped. I feel like it's much cooler walking down the street. And you notice I'm in the middle of the street. Like, I'm not bothering. There's no traffic. Okay, look at this like jungle. All of a sudden, every one of these, this is like a neat community nestled into Fundesi. And that little kitten just watching me. That is a guard kitten if I've ever seen one. He's like, what are you doing at my place? And then this, who knows what's here, but this is really cute. We have a couple dogs on the street checking me out. People do not come down here. Clearly some kind of medical office, I think. This is worth the price of admission right here. All of this. None of this looks anything like anywhere we've been, anywhere else I've been in Nicaragua. Like, awesome. A lot of it could use some, some fixing up. You could use some 
some updating, but it's like all the bits of the project portion of Fundesi that were good with beautiful houses mixed in. Really, really neat. Oh, love Nicaragua, always so cool. Okay, let's cross over here briefly. I'm never gonna be able to find this on a map again. I'm so lost that uh, <laughs> this is like a one-time trip. Better enjoy it while it lasts. All right. And like, there's still little walkways that go between houses and stuff, but we're gonna continue down this really interesting way. And like, there's like nice yards and stuff. I mean, these places could be in Europe. This is so out of place. It's so weird. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this topic a little bit still. So he talked about how he felt really dangerous and I was, I was so we're on the whole danger thing and these, but these gardens, my gosh. And like, look how well maintained this all is. This is just fantastic. And the little angles, the architecture, like it's, it's like, it's like an experiment in a very simple combination of really eclectic housing built into like the remains of a project area. Like that looks like it's still one of the project buildings back there, but with this beautiful walkway garden going up to it. And then this one, who knows, but there's a, there's a dog in there and a nice car. There's a doggy. You're looking at me. You're gonna bark, I can tell. I can tell, you're gonna bark. Nope, he didn't. I know nothing of dogs. And like all of these lawns, these lawns do not get maintained. You don't get grass like that in this area unless someone's putting in an effort. But you can tell that's like a building from the projects. But I feel like someone has taken it and done things with it. Like I just, I can't explain what I'm looking at, but it's amazing. This is such a cool walk. And this place is just so pink with, these, with this curve around the corner. Why are the roads curved? Why is any of this like this? I don't understand. And then like, okay, so there's this walkway and then this one and this building with this triangle corner and this road just meandering through. I can't figure out what's going on. So I asked, where did he feel unsafe? And as far as I can tell, the only places that he really visited in the country were the deep, dangerous barrios of Managua. Now, of course, Managua is a big city and you're gonna be able to find dangerous areas in any big city. It's many times bigger than my hometown of Rochester, New York, and not nearly as dangerous, right? Rochester was absolutely terrifying in sections and areas were perfectly safe as well. We have another kitten watching us from the doorway. Hello, little kitten. And so it's all about comparisons. Can you find barrios in Managua that are dangerous to the point of scary? And yes, the answer is yes, you can. Have I found them? Uh, not that I can identify. I've been through areas in the car and said, wow, that's really scary. I wouldn't want to uh, necessarily uh, be there or get out of the car, but there are things I've just zipped through and I don't know exactly where I was. Okay, we're coming out to the Parque Ruben Dario. So I actually can find this again, very cute dog right there. I know almost exactly where I am, and in just a second, I should know absolutely where I am. We are against the highway. Oh my gosh, interesting. So interesting. I believe that is the corner right down there with the Uno. I believe right down there is where we parked last time that we did this. We're gonna, we're gonna walk and explore this park and make sure we know exactly where we are. But what an amazing part of Fundesi we just discovered. On a day where we've been walking through the projects, we found one of the most amazing, beautiful spots. This is a slam dunk for walking the city and exploring, absolutely. Okay, so specifically the area he was in is the Barrio Venezuela, which I have checked with people and is currently considered an extremely dangerous area. They're like, don't go down there. Uh, so that's important. Are there areas that are truly dangerous in Managua? Yes, it is a giant city. It has areas that are very poor and it has areas that are very dangerous. Would I go into them? Yes, I probably would. Will I go into Venezuela now that it's been brought up as being super dangerous? Yes, I probably will. Um, but should you? No, you definitely should not. In any place you go, there are places you shouldn't wander into just because you can. Okay, I wanna point out, this particular building, this B114, is obviously one of the Fundesi projects. However, it matches one of those houses in the neat area that was so beautiful 
it really, I'm pretty sure what we just saw was a, a portion of the projects that have been gentrified, but gentrified by Nicaraguans, not gentrified by foreigners. I, there's nothing in there that hinted to there being any expats who've ever set foot in that area. And, and it really has made a difference. Now, I want to point something out because, um, I, I mean, you guys know, you watch my show, you know I'm brilliant, right? Like housing, relocation, this is my jam. So I stood on this dirt right here on our first Fundesi episode. We're currently on our third. So you have to go back to the first one in which we explored Fundesi. And I turned around and I looked. So the Uno is right over there. We are on the corner here. And I said, this is the corner of the, the inside corner of the park. Those are the restaurants over there. And I looked at these houses on the corner and I said, these don't look like much, but the, the location is perfect. And if someone was to take the time and take those buildings and upgrade them, this has so much potential to be an amazing place to have a house, a beautiful place to live, so much potential. And that's exactly what we just discovered is that people did that just one street over the, uh, the back side of that block. And it was that beautiful. So I know where we are. We're going to put it on the map. We're going to stop right now, show where we are, and then we're going to show where we were. So we're going to take a minute and I'm going to ramble while the map is up on the screen. This is so cool that we found this and, and we're going to be doing more of Fundesi. This is certainly not enough. Now that we know how cool Fundesi gets, we're doing more, but I do have, I, I have limited time today, uh, but we got, we got some great stuff out. Okay. We're going to walk through the park as I head back to where my car is. Hopefully I can remember where my car is. Actually, I'm pretty close to it. And I did go in loops, but it was perfect. That was perfect. Um, so yes, there's going to be dangerous areas. So I asked a number of things. One is he really seems to have only gone to super dangerous barrios while he was here and, and saw some really sketchy stuff and, and had a really kind of dangerous experience as you would. And this would be the exact same going to the US, exact same going to Canada. This would happen if you went to Iceland probably, right? And chose the most dangerous pieces of the country to go to. So this is like cherry picking the worst of the worst. And then I asked, so all of his questions, I said, when were you here? Because a lot of the things he was describing as scary and things he was concerned about. I was here in 2015, and at that point, some of those things were rumors of the past, but they were ending, and the world has changed dramatically since then. And he said he was here mostly about 2003 to 2005, so 20 years ago. So this is really important for everyone to understand when you're talking to people about Nicaragua. When I'm making this show and I'm saying that it's safe, I am in no way implying or stating or anything that it was safe in the past. There have been times when it was safe and there have been times when it was outrageously dangerous. Nicaragua, like other places, comes and goes with safety. The United States was incredibly dangerous in the 1860s. It's been really dangerous at lots of times in its history. It's very dangerous now. But in general, the U.S. tends to be relatively safe. Nicaragua is similar. Nicaragua tends to be safe when the U.S. is not occupying it and very dangerous when the U.S. is or immediately while the U.S. is trying to occupy it. That is its trend throughout its history. There has never been a significant portion of time in Nicaraguan history where the U.S. has not been actively militarily pressuring the country. So that external pressure tends to be the largest factor into whether things are safe or not. It is what it is. But current Nicaragua, as it has been for the last many years, is extremely safe. And there's no, no reason to believe that that is going to change. We have no known trigger coming in the future that is going to make it unsafe. Of course, we never know what's going to happen, right? Anything could happen. A meteor could hit, right? But it is the actual Nicaragua of today is an incredibly safe country similar to a Canada. When you get a lot of people, especially those who are in the United States, you know, you'll get a ton of people who claim, and they're probably telling the truth, that they are Nicaraguans and they had to flee Nicaragua because it was dangerous. And that the things that I'm saying on the channel are misleading and that it's scary and all this stuff. These are often, almost exclusively, people who, when you ask them, Hola! You can tell it's scary and dangerous here. And... When you talk to them and, and ask, okay, so when were you here? Why did you flee? Oh, well, it was a long time ago. It was some event long time in the past. Like, oh, well, yeah, it was scary and dangerous at some point in the past. That's very different. Like, I feel like they forget that time has moved on. I don't know. 
Um, but they're not addressing Nicaragua today. They're not aware of Nicaragua today. They haven't been here. I've, I've literally had people say this. It's so scary. That's why I haven't been back in 40 years. I'm like, it hasn't been scary for a long time. Like it's had, a as always, my battery died there, so I apologize for that. But yeah, so sometime over the last 40 years, yes, there is potential that the country was dangerous or it was, your situation was dangerous. People leave the United States for those same reasons all the time. I'm here now partially because things are dangerous in the United States, at least more dangerous than they need to be, and things are much safer here. So that, yes, people tell the story, someone they knew, often it's a parent or a grandparent left Nicaragua in a different era under a different government, often back when it was occupied by a foreign military power and people were the subjects of a foreign nation. Yes, during those times, things may have been dangerous and maybe there were unknowns and you felt you needed to leave because it was potentially dangerous. There's, there are a lot of factors that have to be considered, but you have to very carefully filter. When someone says 40 years ago, or in this case, 20 years ago, they felt unsafe or situation was unsafe. Now, in this case, Dwayne, 20 years ago, is talking about something that has not dramatically changed. Very poor, very rough barrios in the middle of Managua. Yes, they remain dangerous, as everyone assumes is true. That does not mean that Nicaragua is dangerous. That does not mean that there's any legitimacy to feeling danger by coming to Nicaragua. That means the same as any other country on Earth. If you go to extremely dangerous spots within a large city, it will be dangerous, and no matter how safe the country or culture or region is, you can find pockets of danger if you seek it out or if you allow yourself to be put into really dangerous situations. I have ended up in Zona 21 in Guatemala City. It's outrageously dangerous. In general, Guatemala City is much more dangerous than Managua, but it's still, if you go there and are sensible, you're not gonna end up somewhere dangerous. In Managua, you must seek out danger. There's no reasonable chance you're gonna end up in a dangerous neighborhood by accident. A tourist, a normal person doing normal things in the city, not going to end up in dangerous areas. You have to go out of your way and intentionally enter those areas. And that's one of the things that makes it so safe is that you're not going to accidentally wander in. In my hometown in Rochester, New York, normal Google directions are going to take you through war zones, places that are so incredibly dangerous. They make Syria in the middle of a bombing run look safe. And I'm not kidding. Your actual death rates are similar to live ammo wars. There's nothing like that in Nicaragua, not even in Managua as I fall over. And, and so you got to put this in context. Just because we say a place is safe, just because a place is safe, just because it's way safer than what you're used to, doesn't mean that there aren't dangerous situations. But he said, you know, he never really felt safe in Nicaragua. I would recommend coming and getting out. Now it is true, something that I do want to point out. I lived here in 2015 and when I lived here in 2015, there were times that I didn't feel super safe. I never felt super dangerous. That's uh, super in danger, right? That's important. But there were times that I didn't feel incredibly safe. Now, in 2023, I do not have those similar experiences. And I go so many more places, so much more of the time. I go to so much poorer places, so much rougher places, so much bigger cities, you name it. And it's so much safer now. Some of that, of course, is my own perspective. But for the most part, it is the change of the country. The country is getting safer and safer and safer. And it's done so much over these years to completely reinvent itself. And that was another part of this discussion. His concerns over why it's so hot, why the construction of the houses is so poor, why, the elect why there's not electricity, why it's dangerous. Most of those things are in a 20 year ago context. 20 years ago, you have to remember, Leon as a city was only liberated from an occupying force that had been here for generations 44 years ago. In the intervening time, it was not completely free. While the occupying force was removed, there was a more than a decade long war. It was somewhere in the vicinity of 14 years of continuing warfare against enormous outside enemies who were wreaking havoc and keeping this country from being able to rebuild. It made things very, very dangerous here for a long time. It made things very poor here, and it made the economy literally a war-torn economy. The government here has needed to rebuild over a much shorter period of time than you think. And when you're looking in the context of being here in 2003, for example, 20 years ago, and today you're talking about a country that has had roughly 10 years years to rebuild itself without a tremendous amount of foreign intervention or 30 years. They were still in their first handful of years, literally 10 years, 
of trying to get their country under control, figure out how to rebuild it, get people back on their feet. People had had their houses bombed. People had fled. People, like The economy was destroyed. So that perspective is important. In 2003, I'm sure his experience was a dangerous one. I'm also sure had he gone out to a Leon, to a Granada, gotten out into the countryside that he would have said, okay, there's a lot of places I feel safe, just not Managua. But Managua has gone through a huge amount of uh, revitalization as well, and there just aren't those kinds of safety concerns anymore. Do you still have to be careful? Yes, of course, it's a big city. There's still poverty, there's still criminals, there's still a lot of people, there's still a lot of traffic. It is a different thing, and that historic context, while real, does not apply to the current world in the same way as you don't go to the United States and say, I feel in danger all the time because slavery is a risk. Slavery was there for hundreds of years. It devastated hundreds of thousands of lives, millions of lives, absolutely one of the worst tragedies in human history. But it's been quite some time, and it's not realistic to look at America through a timeless context and say it's dangerous because you're at risk of slavery. If you warned someone and saying going to the United States because you could be enslaved, they would laugh at you. Like it doesn't make any sense. Nicaragua has been much less time than that. It has not been the 150 years since emancipation, but it has been decades. It has been more than a generation since the country turned itself around and has freed itself from outside oppression and has made those safety concerns go away by and large and is now one of the safest countries in the region. You have to look at that in that context of time. Those opinions of people who fled 40 years ago, those opinions of people who visited 20 years ago, while their experience at the time was real, it is not the experience of this country in this time. That's one of the reasons why it's so important that I get out and walk these streets is because it's easy, especially if you're old like me. If I visited somewhere in 2003, and I did, right, my memory of those places being safe or dangerous tends to carry with me. And if you ask me, how dangerous is Washington, D.C.? Well, I remember it being absolutely scary. I remember the bar that I went to being gunned down by the Jamaican Mafia. People I knew were shot with machine guns in the bar that I went to six days a week. They happened to go on the seventh day. They went on Sunday. I was there Monday through Friday every week and quite often on Saturdays. That everyone that was there was gunned down, that really sticks in my memory. But Washington, D.C. today, while not a super safe place, is not a super dangerous place. It has changed. It has been over 20 years. Since that happened, I think it's been 23 years. It's a different world today, and I have to remember that when I'm looking at Washington, D.C. and say that was nearly a quarter of a century ago. If you were looking at something in a purely history book kind of context, and you said, well, this happened a quarter of a century later, you would automatically think, okay, the things that happened a quarter century ago, they don't really affect now. They, they play some role, but they're really minor. But when you're the person who has that memory, it's hard to not think that it's current, because to me, 20 years ago feels kind of current, right? Like that, that kind of just happened, right? Not really. And people who have been living here and watching day to day as things change, that's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of days have passed. The world has moved on, and much of that, while not forgotten, is not current, and the safety has just all these factors, right? People live in much better housing now than eight years ago, let alone 20 years ago. Uh, people have electricity everywhere. There were foreign government projects to roll out electricity eight years ago. Today, there's electricity everywhere. Things have changed, things have modernized. The infrastructure here went from very, very far behind to relatively ahead of other countries. That's a really big deal that those things have changed in the last few years. All right, we've got a lot to cover today, so I kind of apologize for a long episode, but I also, you're welcome for amazing content and lots of it. By the way, we're at the baseball stadium here in Fundesi and at the stadium, I'm sorry, the baseball field. The stadium is nearby, That's the. but this is just kids playing in the afternoon. It's a beautiful day. So the last couple of statements before I have to run home to eat my grilled salmon dinner is the one of his comments was the police and his worries about the police. Um, and there is a belief that police corruption is a major problem here in Nicaragua. And obviously, I have no way to measure police corruption anywhere. I can tell you firsthand that I have experienced police corruption in Nicaragua. I can also tell you that I have firsthand experienced police corruption in the United States. Uh, so that's just how things are, right? Corruption exists 
everywhere. Uh, here in Nicaragua, though, something that I think is very important. When I lived here in 2015, the concept of there being corruption, of what we call the police shakedowns, and this is generally what tourists and expats are talking about, is that the police would pull you over, claim you were speeding or ran a red light or something of that nature, and try to to give you a ticket. They would then do something like threaten to take your driver's license or uh, whatever they were going to bill you and you had to offer them money or they would ask for money and then they would let you go and you hadn't done the thing. If you did the thing that doesn't count. You hadn't done the thing. And in 2015 uh, my friend Ryan and I were driving through uh, San Marcos and uh, we got pulled over and they said we were speeding and we were stuck in traffic. We were moving like 10 miles an hour. There's no no physically possible way for us to have been speeding. And they tried to shake us down. It was at night and uh, and they they wanted $20 uh, roughly uh, to go away. And that's what we did. We gave them $20 and they left and they never gave us a ticket. And the whole thing was it was a shakedown. Right. And at the time we said that was well worth it. $20 to have the story of been shaken down by the police in Central America. It's like so iconic and so expected that it was kind of cool that it happened. And in a way it was, and now I get to tell that story and welcome to my channel where I can tell the stories of me being shaken down by the police in Central America. That was at the time expected. When it happened, I knew exactly what to do because so many people had had it happen and they knew what to do, what to say, everything, how much to give, period. Since that time, there has been a huge crackdown on corruption. So if your experiences are like 2016 and earlier, you may have or expected to have experiences in Nicaragua where you have been shaken down by the police. That would just be normal if you were driving a car. Since around that time, a huge crackdown on corruption has happened. And today, the idea that that would happen is, is really unlikely. I drive more every week now than I drove the entire time I lived here in 2015. I drive quite far. I am pulled over by the police all the time. Uh, uh, Paul drives all the time. I'm in taxis all the time. And the number of times we've been shaken down by the police in the years that we have been here comes to zero. One time I had the police hint, and this is, this is two and a half years ago, so this is not a current thing. This is quite a bit of time in the general context of this crackdown. I had them hint that they were interested in breakfast which basically would amount to be asking for $3. So 2015, people were forcibly demanding $20. Now people are hinting two and a half years ago that they would like $3 and we laughed at them and left. They did nothing to pressure us and didn't bring it up again. And that is the one and only time there's been even a hint that someone was hungry or looking for something in all the time that we've been here things have changed dramatically and everyone's story matches up. Everyone who tells that there's these shakedowns, when you pressure them, they say, well, yes, it was 2016. That's not that long ago. Well, yes, but it was before the change. And everyone who is telling the story since pretty much universally has a, oh, I remember when that used to happen. No, it hasn't happened in a long time and it's not expected anymore. And when I get pulled over by the police, I no longer feel like it's something I have to worry about. I get pulled over constantly. I hand them my driver's license, I hand them my insurance, I hand them my paperwork for the car. They go, have a nice day, every time. Completely professional, not corrupt at all, no problems whatsoever, and that is interaction after interaction after interaction. I am at a point where if someone was trying to ask me for money, I'd be so confused because it would not even occur to me that that's what they were trying to do. That has changed. He also mentioned that the police stopped working at 5 p.m. No idea where that comes from. Even when I lived here before, that was not the case. The police always were active. Maybe there was a lack of police presence after a certain time because less people were on, fewer people were on, on duty or something, but that is absolutely not the case today. So if that's a rumor you've heard, that is not true. I deal with the police day and night throughout the country. They still have roadblocks in the middle of the night checking that paperwork like I described. They're out on the streets patrolling all the time. We see them on the beach when we've had issues at night. They are there immediately, day or night. No problems like that. Um, I've never had anyone hint at something like that, so that really threw me off guard. Um, but that's not a thing. Maybe 20 years ago, maybe there was something where like the police just stopped working at a special, I have no idea. But um, I have friends here who are police and who work overnight. So like I know firsthand, that is not how things work. There is absolutely full-time police going on all over the country. I see them everywhere. My local police in Sutiava, they're out, you know, watching traffic, watching the neighborhood all through the night. Um, so that is not a concern. You have a very professional, very well-covered police presence throughout the country. 
I, I realize why people have these, these stories from when they've traveled here previously, and many of them are certainly true. But again, be aware, the world has changed, time has moved on, and the Nicaragua of today is nothing like those stories. That's why we're out here showing the country so you can see firsthand that this is not the Nicaragua that people remember. All right, the last one, this is also really important. So Dwayne mentioned that on his channel, he has a YouTube channel, I will do my best to link it below. I'm really bad about that stuff, but I'm gonna try. I may link it eventually after I put this up and people remind me, hey, I can't find the link and then I'll go look for it and put it. So Dwayne mentions that he gets hostile, he didn't say how many, but he gets a number of hostile comments from locals on his channel. Presumably he's talking about Nicaragua and uh, Buenos Tardes and uh, they're making uh, nasty comments one way or another. And he didn't say exactly what they are, but I know what they are, right? Because I get them on a regular basis as well. And I have a few important things to say about them. One is I have never once, and I have a lot of visibility here in the country, never once have I received an actual verifiable nasty comment from a Nicaraguan. I have received many nasty comments. Every one of them, when pressed, when I research, looks or is suggestive that it came from North America, not from Central America. There's cases where I can't prove it, but there's never been a case where I could find evidence of it being from Central America. And I made a short about this uh, about six months ago, who knows when, a long time ago. And I mentioned that one of the things that consistently comes up when I get nasty comments is they are almost always really simple, which means they could be coming from anywhere. Like they're just, it looks like a bot saying just nasty things. Or, or they are uh, very clearly um, aimed at evoking an American response. They are worded in such a way that they um, are, are, look like a copy paste from a standard playbook that only makes sense if you are an American talking to another American. And like, for a couple of reasons. One is the topics. They often state things that if you were a Nicaraguan would be good, right? Like, it's a beautiful country. And in Nicaragua, being a beautiful country is a good thing. In America, be like, it's a beautiful country, it's so awful, right? Like, it's, it's the way that things are presented that Americans are taught some of these things are bad and the rest of the world is taught that they're good. Using them in an accusatory manner would not be sensical for a Nicaraguan. And they're also generally topics that don't make sense for Nicaraguans to care about. And so I'm completely confident. I don't have any hint of, of wonder where those comments are coming from. Those are Americans, either Nicaraguans who have grown up in America or Americans posing as Nicaraguans just in general, um, who are making nasty comments, attempting to get attention on the thread. And this is standard. You do this on Reddit, you do it anywhere you post, you're going to get flooded with these if you're making content about Nicaragua. And um, they, they use certain patterns that are really standard uh, of logical fallacies. They use leading arguments and, uh, you know, misstated facts and, um, you know, straw men, things like that, that are repeated over and over again. And it looks to me like there is a central agency that is putting out a guidebook on what to say to people posting about Nicaragua. And they don't even require you to respond. All they require for you is to not delete the comment. And they have these leading questions that make it seem like the things that they're questioning are true true. For example, you could post, uh, what a beautiful day in Nicaragua, and someone responds, oh, how can you say it's a beautiful day since Nicaragua has been uh, burying nuclear waste in the desert, right? And when people read it, they don't question, is that good or bad? They question, wow, how could they, how could they say it's a beautiful day when they're burying nuclear waste in the desert? And people won't question, does Nicaragua even have nuclear waste? Well, wait, does it even have a desert? No to both counts. But you state it in such a way, people naturally don't question it because you're not saying, hey, I heard there's a desert. Hey, I heard they're burying waste. They're saying, I know that these things are true. What's wrong with you for supporting it? And there, it's a way to try to make the argument move a layer away from the actual thing they're trying to sneak in. And that happens in nearly every post. It is super common. And it's always the same things, and it's always things that would only be negative to an American, and only an American who hasn't studied politics or taken you know, a really deep dive into uh, propaganda and understanding the American propaganda machine. As an American, they're still stating things that are positive to me. If my father read the comments, he'd be like, wait a second, they just said a bunch of good things about Nicaragua. Where's, why is the tone negative, right? And it's a marketing trick. Say good things with a negative tone and people assume you meant something bad and they'll fill in the gaps. 
it is incredibly powerful to market to people that way. So that kind of stuff I see all the time in the comments. You guys don't see them because YouTube normally filters them out, but they do exist. I see them because I take the, the time to look at them. I see them much more on Reddit where they actually have moderators who are clearly paid to protect those posts. When you point out that they're false information, they're like, no, 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 we allow that. But if you dispute it, they go, we don't allow disputing false posts. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, we see how that works. Um, so it's, it's, there's definitely a pattern to it and it is obviously coming from North America. Um, or at least being paid for by North, North America. Um, are there other comments that fall into a gray middle ground? Yes, once in a while I get a comment that's like, hmm, this could be negative and it could be from someone in the country, I just don't know. But at the times where I wonder, they're generally not very negative. I have gotten a few comments that um, complain about the fact that I don't speak Spanish well enough, um, people who complain that I don't know some of the context, but generally when they do so, uh, it's a situation where they demonstrated that they didn't know the context or were ignoring it um, and or they're doing so in English and there's no way to know if they actually speak Spanish and they simply are attacking my Spanish because I'm recording in English. None of you hear me speak Spanish. A whole bunch of police are going by me, by the way. I'm, they're all waving. Too bad they're not on camera. And uh, uh, because I don't speak Spanish on the channel very often, um, a veces, uh, at most, it's it really hard to come out and say that I suck for not being able to speak Spanish. Um, I don't speak Spanish very well, so that, that is true, but you only know I don't speak Spanish well because I tell you I don't speak Spanish well. I'm not lying about it. I don't. It's not that, very, it's not that good. Um, but uh, it's a weird thing to attack me based on me volunteering that I don't speak Spanish well. And if you want to see how well I speak Spanish, um, a couple months ago I was on national television in Spanish on live interview and it was one of my better performances of that type of thing so i think it's a good example i managed to maintain composure and not completely freak out uh, and for the most part i was able to do the interview um, and i've gotten some compliments on it thank you to those of you who've watched it and and claim to be impressed at, at very least um, and uh, it made me feel very good to be able to do that that shows kind of where my spanish level is um, and so feel free to watch that and comment away and be like, wow, I can't believe you live here and are so bad at your Spanish. Um, but that, um, uh, it, it's a very strange thing to attack me over, right? Someone who I, I've put in a lot of effort to learn Spanish. I speak Spanish every day. I've been on TV in Spanish. Um, I volunteer that I'm not good at it to then be like, oh, terrible Americans coming here who don't speak Spanish or you're, you know, you're just trash for not speaking Spanish. Um, that does not feel like something that's coming from Nicaraguans. And in person, I have never once gotten a negative comment about my Spanish, ever. I've been told, ooh, it'd be important for you to learn more Spanish? Absolutely. And that's mostly from my lawyer. Uh, but from a, a personal interaction level, um, never once have I gotten any impression from anyone in Nicaragua or anyone I could verify was in Nicaragua that was negative as to my level of Spanish or my lack of speaking it. I, people say, well, it'd be great if you spoke more Spanish. Yes, different. Um, but all those negative comments, all of it, I'm pretty confident is not coming from Nicaragua. Is that mean there's no negative person in Nicaragua? No, no, that doesn't mean that. Um, but it does imply the thing that I believe is, is pretty true is that people who are negative about Nicaragua are not going to English language travel channels and taking the time to comment in English uh, negative comments in that way. It, it's not a very logical place for them to hang out and to find the content and to do so. Uh, and I believe that that's probably the case. If they knew it was there and it was easy to comment, would they do it? Probably. But um, I don't think that's what's happening. So for Dwayne, who's getting those negative comments, um, I would say you're probably experiencing negative neg negativity coming from America. And anybody who's saying positive things about Nicaragua is going to get an American backlash. That's, I'm, I guarantee, if you're seeing negativ negativity in the comments, that's where it's coming from. It is not coming from here. It's not coming from locals. If it was, you, you'd really know. It would stand out. People would be making uh, quite a big effort to make that happen. Thanks for joining me. I did all this earlier. Like and subscribe. Ask your questions. Get in the comments. Let me know what you think. Buy me a coffee. Support the channel. Share online. And I will see all of you manana.